It's about falling in love with the process. Don't practice it till you get it right. It's like practice it until you can't get it wrong. If you're gonna become certified, the goal for you should be to go show up and have fun. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to the Strength Connection Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kurkowski. Thanks so much for joining me today. In this episode, I got to connect with Oz Aponte. He's Strong First team leader and the owner of Iron Core Way in San Diego, California. So if you follow Oz already, you know how incredible his strength and his movements are. He is my aesthetic role model. I've been watching his training for a long time, whether it be body weight, kettlebells, whatever modality, he has such fluidity and grace in all his movements, which I found come from his life in skateboarding, martial arts, dance, and hard style training. So Oz has a beautiful way of approaching training and his articulation and description of both structured and intuitive training is incredible. And I had a blast learning from him and speaking with him here. So I appreciate you spending some time with me here. If you enjoyed this episode, I hope you take a moment, give it a review wherever you're listening to, and please share with a friend, help spread the message of strength. Awesome, thank you so much guys. Now let's get on with the show. What's up everybody? Welcome back. Oz, dude, it's so nice to meet you. Thanks so much for coming on, man. This is gonna be great. Likewise, I've been looking forward to this moment. I, I didn't even think it would happen, but it has. Look, dreams come true. <laughs> Dream, dreams come true. Um, well, it's funny. We both exchanged our mutual fandom of each other uh, beforehand on here. We got our fanning out of the way. But, <laughs> dude, I've, I've loved following you for a long time. I've seen the work that you've done in our little community of Strong First and RKC. And I said, like, the if there's a description of grace in movement, you are one of the guys that I was like, the aesthetic... Uh, role model that I look for there from the body weight work, you know, from your uh, work in hard style training. It is just, it's a joy to follow you. So I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, hear a little bit more about your story today. Uh, this is a great moment for me. So I'm stoked to be here. Yeah. So we were just jamming for a while about kind of the intuitive <laughs> training and like we were just, I was going to start just going off and I was like, we better start recording this. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I know we come from some similar backgrounds of some work through strong first. I know you're a team leader. Now you're in leadership there. Congrats on that. That's awesome. Well, well deserved on there. And, uh, just the, um, you had a quote in iron in the iron cardio book of Brett that I thought was so perfect that I'm going to uh, bring up where you talked minimalist without being stingy, which I'll just throw in the in the listeners' minds right now because we'll come back to it on there. Um, but really, man, you uh, you know you've been such a uh, student of the game for so long with the experience that you put out with Iron Coreway. So we'll uh, we'll dive into your story here. So to start with, I'd love to hear kind of how you got into this world. I know you've done dance, martial arts, strength training. What was kind of the first modality that you really dove into in life? Well, if I go back to the beginning, it has to be skateboarding. Mm. And I was like, I was like seven or eight, maybe even younger than that. I was, I was, I grew up in an environment that in, invited that type of activity because I had two, two uncles that were basically like my, I was like their little brother. They were still teenagers. So they love skateboarding. They love rollerblade, or not rollerblade. I'm sorry. Um, uh, roller skates. Mm -hmm and you know bicycles and climbing trees and running and going to the river and they would take me and to do all these different things you know when I was a little kid so I was always very active but one of the things that they did was skateboard and so I started with that now it, it might seem a little weird like but skateboarding is incredibly specific yeah. and it's also incredibly stylish like style in skateboarding it's like a a very important part of it mm -hmm. so when you start to to unfold the things that I've done after that, then you can see why to me, like good form and style and yeah. that kind of like graceful movement is very important because in, in the very beginning, that was kind of like something that was important to me. And from there, I jumped into martial arts mm -hmm. uh, and that was, I was about 13 years old. It just kind of overwhelmed my life. Like I was like, oh, this is so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like it just gave me purpose for that entire time you know, mm -hmm. like I was a student and a son and a brother and all that, but I always just thought of myself as a martial artist. Like I just loved the discipline and actually the pedigree as well, right? Like if you do traditional martial arts, you can go back to the origin, like who was the founder of the system mm -hmm. and what is the lineage, you know, coming up, you know, you can still trace that, you know, in today's world, you can go back to the original people that form all these systems. And that's another aspect of it that, of, of physical training that fascinated me. So mm -hmm. when I was looking at magazines and, you know, when I was growing up, it was mostly like muscle and fi uh, fitness flex mm -hmm. magazine. That was about the extent, at least where I lived in Puerto Rico of the, the fitness advice that I could get. 
but even that had its own lineage, right? If you go back to the old school bodybuilders, you know, yeah, yeah, like yeah. the Reeves and, you know, the, this old school strongman and stuff like that. There was always a little bit of that peppered in. And so style and grace and lineage was always something that interested mm-hmm. me. So when I got out of the army and I started doing personal training and I kind of like got rubbed off with this whole, uh, at the time it was the RKC. Mm-hmm. It included both of those things. Right away, I could see that. I could see mm-hmm. that th- there's an emphasis on form here that I haven't seen in any other system that I've touched on yet yeah. in terms of strength training. And there's a clear lineage. Like there's mm-hmm. there's some kind of hierarchy here as who like, you know, hey, like this guy is the founder, obviously, no last name needed, right? Oh, and right. then there's <laughs> other dudes that, that just roll down. And so I saw this opportunity to be part of something special. And I was just like, I want in, like, I, I want to be part of this yeah. you know, for very selfish re- reasons for all, but also because I could see the benefit. And if I wanted to be a coach and a trainer, I was going to help a lot of people with this. So I had to be part of it. And mm-hmm. so ever since then, it's been a mixture of my love for strong first, or oftentimes I say hard style so that I can incorporate all of the people. True. Right? Yep. Um, but, but, you know, like being part of strong first now, obviously like it's really important for me, but it is about trying to combine those, th- those things, right? The, the <laughs> love for the affinity for form and, you know, having some kind of like lineage of like, hey, here's our founder and here's all the great teachers of our time. And my aspiration is to be one of them one day, right? To be recognized at that level. And the only way to do that is to work really hard on your own practice, mm-hmm. but also as a coach. And I think that's that's where this all like kind of makes yeah. sense. That's so interesting. It's uh, there's a couple of threads in there as I would pull on is that that grace and movement together and what you said about lineage. It's like when you actually see that there's a history behind it and the people that were doing it before are doing the same thing that you're getting taught now. It's like it just builds that foundation in your mind of like, okay, well, this has been around for a while and people are doing it like it just solidifies some some trust and some truth in it right there off the bat. The skateboarding piece is so interesting because I had quite a few friends growing up that were big into it. I never got into it. I was more like baseball and basketball in that, but it's that, um, it's like, there's so much failure that's involved in skateboarding, right? And just getting it down. It's like to actually land a trick to actually ollie properly to hit like your first, like, you know, 180 or so. Like it takes a lot of practice to do. It's like, it almost builds in that emphasis of failure right off the bat, it seems. 100%. Look, if you have children, people listening out there, and you want to build resilient children, get them into skateboarding mm. because it's a frustrating activity, right? Like it takes a long time. You got, you know, you know what this is? And, and I know this is something that because I'm, I'm such a big fan of your show. I know this, we've talked yeah. about this before in the show, and it is about like building the resiliency, but it's about resiliency in terms of fitness, it's about falling in love with the process. Yeah. If you don't love skateboarding for the sake of skateboarding, you're you're not going to be successful at it because yeah. it's going to take you a thousand times to get that trick right, you know? Mm-hmm. Get it exactly how you want and then a thousand more just to make it look a little bit better. So it, it's, it's, I don't know why, you know, like I, I feel fortunate that that was my path, but it, again, it really set me up for what was to come and for mm-hmm. me to have the approach that I have into like, I want to be about the process, you know? Yeah. You know, it's funny because I can I can kind of put that together in a few different ways where like when you hit that trick in skateboarding the first time, like I always equated like the first time I hit a home run in baseball. And it's a different type of feeling when the ball hits the bat. Like you don't yeah. feel that sting in your hands, like everything feels balanced. All of a sudden you hear a different type of sound. You're like, oh. That's what I want to get to. I hear people who are big golfers say that all the time, like it's hitting that sweet spot and you'll come back to playing shitty golf over and over again, just to find that one. <laughs> again, it's probably the same with, uh, you know, with skateboarding, like you hit that trick and that's okay. Now don't practice it till you get it right. It's like practice it until you can't get it wrong. I see that so much of why people get into things like hard style kettlebell training. Cause like when you hit like a clean, the right spot in that right moment. And it feels so fluid or you snatch a bell for the first time. It's like that same feeling like, oh, you've been banging your wrist over and over again until finally you hit that first moment, that first one where it's like, it doesn't hurt. There's almost like this quizzical look that gets on people's face. Like, ooh, that's what it feels like. Oh, I can practice this. It's a really cool thing to see over and over again. It really is. It's it's amazing to experience it yourself, right? But, you know, like we are... We are kind of like nerds about this stuff, right? We're going to do it no matter what. 
But if you're trying to teach it to someone who doesn't quite have the same level of appreciation or understanding about it, and, when, and that's going to be their moment, you know, we talk about aha moments, that, that may be a different kind of moment. It's like a, a conversion moment where now you, you, you are sold on this, you know, because mm-hmm. you had that experience, you know, and, and so much of learning is about the intensity of these experiences. So, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, like, I, I've never hit a home run, but I can imagine, right, based on some of the other things, like, you know, maybe being on stage and yeah. nailing your solo and feeling like there's nothing that I would change about that performance, yeah. right? Something like that. It's just, there's a, an effortless, effortless uh, concentration that leads into this optimal performance. And that's, right. that state, you know, it's just like you said, it's just like, it, it sounds different. It feels different, but it's just really easy. It just kind of flows. Boom. You're like, wow. Yeah. There it goes. Yeah. Well, it's something too that I think, you know, so many things need to align right to like to hit a ball out of the ballpark or to hit that trick in it or to hit your solo, then all of a sudden it's over. And it's like, I mean, that's where people talk. Yeah. It's the flow state. It's that high performance state. Like you're not thinking about anything else. You know, it's like, you know, people would say like, that's the ultimate like glimpse of heaven right there. It's like, you're nothing else is going on in life. And you can get into that, that modality in strength training to do it. I've seen people do it. I've been there myself and but it is, it's a kind of more of an understanding of the process of it versus the results. Now you went from skateboarding, then you went into martial arts. What was the modality that you worked in with martial arts first? So I started off with Taekwondo because mm-hmm. it was very popular in Puerto Rico. There were many, many schools. They, they were, I, don't, I know you like TV. I don't know if you're watching this show, but they were a little bit like Cobra Kai. They were everywhere. They were just like taking over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then um, I, I was staying with my grandmother in And on my way back from Taekwondo, actually on my way to Taekwondo, on my way back, I would pass by this other school. It was a praying mantis kung fu school. And they started before my other class. And when I was coming back, they were still practicing. And I was just like, oh, okay. So a couple of times I looked in and, you know, the instructor would always like come up and be like, hey, can I help you? You got any questions? And I was like, no, just looking. One day, you know, he talked to me a little more and said, why don't you just come in and take a class? And I did. And that was the last time I, I, I went to the Taekwondo school. Like I started, I, I just fell in love with Kung Fu. Kung Fu had, again, a lot of the same elements. There was um, really low stances in this particular style of Kung Fu. Um, a lot mm-hmm. of acrobatic movements and jumps and leaps and this really cool poses. So it was just the complexity of it called my name. Mm-hmm. But... But in, in, you know, kind of tying this up to some of the things that we've talked about, if I hadn't had the base that I had from Taekwondo, I wouldn't have picked it up so quickly. So that was a necessary step for me. You know, the, the forms in Taekwondo are not quite as intricate as in Kung Fu in terms of okay. like movement. Think about it like this. Think about a really basic level jazz dance, you know, a little bit like that, a little bit of okay. tapping yep. here and there that you would do for like a student showcase. And then think about, one of the best performances that you've seen, you know, your lady do on, on ballet with her, yeah. mm-hmm. right? That is, I mean, clearly there's a distinction in, in complexity there. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's how the forms, you know, the, the and the form, you know what the forms are, right? Like those sets that you practice to do all the techniques. I've so seen, in- I've seen them. Yeah. It's like, you know, Kung Fu, I think too, a lot of people think like that over, like, that's an overarching umbrella to all different modalities like we yep. hear because because Keanu Reeves said it in the matrix like a million years ago and it's like <laughs> <but> no, <laughs> you know but kung fu that there's it's a specific practice that you do which is kung fu yeah so you know w- within the you know to, to explain that a little bit more within mm-hmm. kung fu there's two major distinctions you have northern styles and you have southern styles okay okay the Northern styles tend to be more acrobatic and external in nature. External meaning like it's not an internal art as if we'd be like with Tai Chi, right? Mm, tai Chi it. is, is it's considered to be an internal type of uh, martial art. That's why it's very, you know, soft and subtle. It doesn't mean that it can't be used, you know, to, to express a lot of power, but the practice itself, it's what is it's considered internal. Go ahead. Oh no, I'm just listening. It's it's interesting. <laughs> no, because I've I've actually done um some Tai Chi work like in the last year or so from the work I've done with Sifu Singh and his mind boxing program. So I understand that piece of it. Right. So then you know you, you can also make the distinction of internal martial arts and external martial arts. 
And then within those, those different camps, you have the different styles, right? Mm. So you have like Wing Chun, which is famous because Bruce Lee used to practice it. You have Praying Mantis, you have uh, Tiger Claw, you have Shaolin Five Animal Styles, you have uh, White Lotus, you have, you have all these different styles, you know? And again, cool thing, you can trace it back to the person that started it. You know, in, in my mm -hmm. case with, with uh, Praying Mantis, there was a gentleman named Wang Long, and he was the one that put together a praying mantis by playing around with a plain praying mantis with a little stick and looking at the way that the hand yeah. were. And because the footwork of the praying mantis wasn't such like, so cool, let's just say, or useful or utilitarian, he had to incorporate the footwork of a different martial art, which was the monkey. So mm, okay. praying mantis has like a lot of monkey influence in terms of footwork, but the hands are all drawn from the inspiration of the praying mantis itself. And you can just wow. go on and on. Yeah, that's so fa that's fascinating. It's so interesting, all the different details, because I've heard some of the history of it as well, of like, because it was almost like so tight lipped for a long time, right? It's like, if you followed this practice, like they didn't want it getting out. And then I know it's like the famous story of Bruce Lee brought it in and kind of made it more mainstream. And I think he got a lot of blowback from it from the masters of like bringing over those practices before because they wanted to keep that heritage for so long. Like they didn't want it like going out and, you know, getting out into the Western culture as much. So it's, it's really, it's an, it's a really fascinating lineage in history. That is a fascinating lineage. And I think that's an important thing too, in terms of like our own system, right? Because like, it's almost like how was the one that kind of like opened it up to the world, right? Like, you yeah. know, I mean, luckily he didn't have anybody chasing him down <laughs> telling him like, you can't do this. Don't share yeah. our secrets. Right. Yeah. Well, it's funny because, I mean, you go back to that story as well with Pavel. I think it's, um, and I don't think I'm speaking out of school here, but he didn't think that it was going to catch on in, you know, in our culture in America. And then I think it was Marty Gallagher and a couple other people who kind of said like, no, like, like the world needs this style of training. Like this is a principle-based program. You need to get it out. And then just it's sky, you know, it's skyrocketed in there. And I got into it, I think about 2009, 2010, when it was like getting into the height of it from there. I think it was around probably the same time that you started getting into it as well, right? I picked it up in 05. Oh, in early fun, on, okay. Fun fact, I did, like I took a workshop with uh, Sir Laurie at Iron Corps in La Jolla. And then she recommended that I went to Dragon Door if I wanted to buy a quality kettlebell. So while I was there, um, this was the end of 05. So early 2006, the ETK that entered the kettlebell book came out and I was like, yeah, you know, I'll give it a shot. I ended up doing that program for three years, three years. That's all I did. It was ETK for three years. And, and that's basically how I got ready to go to my certification in 2008 is when I became an RKC. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I always tell people the goal, if you're going to become certified, the goal for you should be to go show up and have fun. Like don't show up and struggle through the weekend because your hands are not prepared or your back's given out or whatever. Like mm -hmm. I remember just having so many reps in my body that when I showed up, it was like no big deal. And back then the test wasn't even a five minute snatch test. You had to do 50 total snatches with a 24 and you only had one hand switch. One hand switch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I remember I showed up, we did it right as, as soon as you showed up, you sign some paperwork and go test your snatch. And then after that, it was a whole lot of fun through the weekend, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, oh, it's, it's changed quite a bit over the years. <laughs> yeah, right. I was like that. I remember that it's because we used to snatch that. That was the first thing. Nobody knew anybody. It's just like, Hey, how are you? Grab your snatch test bell, go out and we're going to crush you out for about five minutes. And then we'll chat afterwards. And then some so, people were like, what is that? <laughs> You're like, Oh God. Well, it is. No, it's, I love that you said that Oz. Cause if anybody who is preparing for, you know, going into SFG type work, I mean, it's a high volume based certification program. You know, I think that's where it's such a beautiful thing. There is a rite of passage kind of bringing it back to ETK. It's like everybody has their, there's a commonality of bond that you have to go through that and spend extra time getting that volume in there. And like you said, like the goal of it should be have fun at this workout. If you think you're just going to go in there and you'll figure it out at that time, it's like, it's going to be you might figure it out, but it's going to be a rough weekend for you. Like you are not going to enjoy it from there. Your hamstrings are going to be on fire. You're, you're going to probably going to rip your hands up. So yeah, get that extra three years of ETK. I mean, that is, that's one approach to go right there. That's a, that's a lot of pressing. man. 
and, and full disclosure, the reason why that worked for me at the time, because everyone questioned right before that, right? I have been doing like, you know, traditional bodybuilding style workouts, you know, I, I have always been an, uh, a fan of calisthenics and mm-hmm. the push up, the, the regular push up is like my favorite exercise. I've okay. been doing it since I was a little kid, you know, and that's another thing that I got from my uncles, right? Because one of my uncles practiced martial arts. And, you know, he taught me how to do push-ups very early on. I like eight, seven, eight years old, something like that. Mm-hmm. I've been doing it ever since. But, you know, when you, when you think about martial arts, right, you go to a traditional school and you may be asked to do nothing but a horse stance for three months, 90 days, easily. A traditional martial arts school. Mm-hmm. Just the horse stance, Okay. So I found great value in finding a protocol that allowed me to practice just a few things, but get really deep into it, right? An inch wide, a mile deep. And that was a setup that I had from my martial arts training. So I was appreciating the simplicity, but the elegance of the style, because I don't think I was leaving anything on the table. I was getting strong. My body composition looked great. And Mm -hmm. I was working on my conditioning my hands, hand balancing improved during that time. And so did my dancing. And that was, that's the part, right? So I was dancing full time. I was taking a lot of class, mm-hmm. like three or four classes a week. I was rehearsing two to three times a week and performing on most weekends. What type of dance? Of, so it was contemporary dance. Okay. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the name of my company, and I'm going to throw this out because you, you know about this. So it was called Mojo Less. So it was modern uh, jazz ballet. It's a combination oh, gotcha. of the three. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, amazing, amazing. In fact, they just celebrated their 20th year anniversary and my wife performed with them because my wife used to dance for them as well. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic company. But what I did was mostly modern, uh, a lot of, a lot of influences from jazz. Some of the ladies in the company had like ballet backgrounds and things like that. So some of their pieces looked a little bit different than mine, but the biggest influence for me was the martial arts, right? Because I'm really flexible. I can get my leg all the way up, you know, Mm -hmm. kick really high and I could lift women like really easily, you know? Yeah. So it was mm-hmm. like an easy end to the company, you know? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but uh, but having that affinity for something that is so simple and just being able to focus on that, it, it was a gift in my dance career because I didn't have to go and be like, oh my God, like now I got to train. Now I'm going to be sore and all that stuff. Right. I would say past the first 90 days, I was never ever sore again from doing ETK but it yeah. was supporting what I was doing. And I could focus on the one thing that I really wanted to do, which was dance really well. And being like in my thirties, trying to get into dance, that was mm-hmm. challenging, you know? Yeah. I'm dancing around people that are like 20 years into their dance. Oh, career, absolutely. Yeah. Which is why it took so much class. Like I was so devoted, man. So devoted, but you know, it was a great experience. I traveled, I went to Europe to dance and, and that was an amazing experience. Yeah. Um, and here in California, we travel quite a bit. So incredible and it's very similar to the martial arts so it was an, an easy step for me to take and having the kettlebell was the gift that i didn't know i had because it allowed me to maintain a certain level of physical fitness that was above the average but it really encouraged what i was doing on the floor you know on the stage amazing yeah. it was just incredible that's amazing i can i can see from following you in your movements i knew them i could see the martial arts background and the foundation but i also saw the dance flow as well. And we were talking about that before of, it's interesting, like when you see like a beautiful dance on stage, whether it be ballet or modern or contemporary, like it's so challenging if you were going to do that yourself, but it looks so effortless and it looks so graceful in it. And it's like, that's why, like I look at that and I love mastery. So I can see that and be like, oh my God, like that is something to aspire to. And there's such a creativity behind it. But as we were talking about before, like, creativity is bred from foundational work. Like it's not just a do whatever the fuck you want type stuff, you know? (laughs) It's like, no, like follow these parameters, get these things down. Kind of like you said, like you might just go do a horse dance and until you have that down over and over again, they're not gonna move you to the next thing. And I think it's still something that we, we love variety. You know, it's like Netflix comes out with a new show every single day you know, out there, like we want different stuff all the time. But in training, it's like, if you build that foundation up, like you earn your way into that creativity afterwards. And then all of a sudden, everything gets so much fun. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if I could, because I think about this a lot, and I hear about it a lot, it's a, 
as a problem. Like people that program hop or people that are like, oh, I'm going to do this now. I'm going to do that now. And it's just, there's not enough time for the body to adapt to something and really like make it autonomous, which is ultimately the goal. You know, we talk about that effortless concentration that leads into optimal performance that comes from autonomy of movement in the sense that it just flows out of you. You don't have to think about it anymore because you've done it so many times thoughtfully, mind you, right? You can do something many times, but if you're not really concentrated, you know, in what you're doing, then it's not, you're going to get good at doing it kind of like, okay, you get Mm. good at doing it really well if you practice really well. So the quality of your practice time has to be akin to what your expected performance is going to be, you know? So, so, you know, I can, I can lift a lot of kettlebells. I can swing a certain way and I'm going to get good at exactly that way. Right. So Mm -hmm. if my knees are not locking out at the top or I'm not bracing at the top or maybe my shoulders disconnected, you will get good at that a hundred percent. But to have that perfect form with the shoulder packed and the core brace and the knees locked and rooting car style plank at the top, sinking the breath at the bottom and at the top, all of that, it has to be practiced precisely. You can't expect to practice one way and then go perform a different way. It doesn't happen. Oh yeah, exactly. You know, it's funny because I was uh, I was talking with um, my girlfriend once when she was setting up a rehearsal, and her choreography was just amazing out there. And I was just like, and we were watching like a show, like the So You Think You Dance show or something like that. And it's like, how do they learn? I'm like, how do they learn this choreography so fast? It's like they're learning like these dances like every week, and they're so intricate. It's just like you just know what one thing goes to another. Like they built the foundation. She's like, I could see like where the formations are and where they're going to go just because you know it like so much, but it takes so much practice over time of just building those foundations that just all of a sudden then you flow into one thing versus another. And the point that I was making on this is when I got into SFB body weight training, when I did that, there's so much like work of high tension that you need to get into. Like if you're, if you've never done a one-arm one on like push up, like you have to know how to tense your entire body but I didn't fully get it until I actually focused on the lift because I was so focused on how much tension I could create that I was throwing myself off till finally I like trusted my tension because I got enough reps in that I could actually just focus on the lift. And it seems like that's, that's when you really get into the process of it. And it's like, yeah, like build the tension, get your reps in. So you can focus on the grace of movement afterwards. It's the dominanta, right? That's what the manual calls it, right? Like you Mm got to create tension, but you got to make the lift happen. Um, And and going back to the, what you mentioned about your girlfriend and her choreography. So another, another idea or concept that gets floated around a lot on this podcast is the idea of movement as vocabulary or movement as language and different variations of that idea. And so what she was describing is like, when you look at it, you see every everything is a new word. Mm. Everything is a new word. When she looks at it, she sees paragraphs. She may not even see the, yes. the whole story. Like, go like, yeah, I know what this is. Because that's how we learn movement, right? You learn something really simple, like a wrist glide. Like if you move your wrist from side to side. And then when you have to do a one-on-one like push-up, you have to extend your wrist, but flex your elbow extend mm-hmm. your shoulder, brace your core. So all of these things are up to a beginner are one thing, just like the choreography that you're looking at. It's like, you did this and that. And you know, they're jumping around. You're like, oh my God, there's so many things. But to her more experienced, right? Developed movement vocabulary mind, she sees one thing. And so the goal with us is to be able to look at movement and express it as a sentence or even as a paragraph instead of a collection of letters because you are so well versed in each mm-hmm. one of those letters that they're no lo- you don't no longer have to think about it. You can just look at the movement, put it all together and see like, okay, I think I got that part, that part, that part, that part. There's one part I don't get. Can you please explain it to me? Oh, this is what it, oh, okay, got it, boom. And then you put it all together and you can do it. Mm. It's not like learning every single thing at once, right? We learn movement by chunking. At first it's all you know, if you think about the movement, um, movement learning theory, it's cognitive. You're thinking about everything. 
associative, you start to put things together as neural chunking. Uh-huh. And then there's the autonomy, the autonomous stage where it just, yes. right? So, so with our system, because it's principles-based, because it's so simple in the beginning, if you simply allow yourself a couple of years, three years, I, I would love to see people do like three years of just the, the, the level one, two stuff. When you go to the level two, when you go, go to the other things, even barbell and body weight, you're going to feel a facility about what you're doing because you're no longer looking at letters. You're looking at full on sentences and stories with the movement. That's I, I love that you brought that up, Oz. I think there's what the analogy that you used of, of the language and the alphabet versus the paragraphs. I think that is so huge because it's like we want we want to look at the best of the best and copy them. Like, and if we've never done it before, not realizing that they're they're seeing it in a full, they're seeing it the whole page and they can read it in two seconds. Mm-hmm. Where we're on ABC right off the bat when it's something brand new. That's a beautiful way of describing it from there. But the point that you brought up about focusing on like the one modality first. Yeah, I've talked about this with uh, a couple people about excelling through different certifications and different movements and knowledge is great. Knowledge is power. I think it's great. But if we don't absorb it, like, and we don't actually follow through it, I just wrote about this where at the end of my level one with um, an RKC with John Ingham, you know, I spent six months training for this one event and it's like, oh, right, now you're going to be an instructor. You're so pumped up. You're like, I did it. Like there's a conclusion to it. And he said, he's like, this is just the beginning. And I kind of, I knew what he was talking about, but I really didn't fully understand it. It's like, no, you're just brand new in this game. You just got here. You know, it's like a guy who just got called up to the big leagues. Like you're a rookie. Like you are just going to learn a brand new system. And I was so happy that I did level one for a couple of years and just really, internalize those movements over and over again, because it's, it's so fun. It's like, you want to get to the next one. Oh, I want to go to the next one. It's a great, <laughs> exciting thing. But I think it's a really important point that you said there of like, yeah, learn the level one skills first, do that for a few years, yeah. like not, not a few months, like do it for a few years, yeah. you know? And it's like, that's why I love what Brett's done with the iron cardio, because his book is out now and it's phenomenal, but he's been doing this the last two years every day. And like figuring out after decades of work that he's done afterwards. So I love that point that you brought up of just do it for way longer than you probably think and just build that foundation. Here's another thing, like hopefully, hopefully, and then if I'm not one to go anywhere and try to convince people to start working out, even though that's my job, right? That's just what I do for a living, but that's not, you know, I'm I'm not about that. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, if if you're a person out there who started on this journey and you are contemplating, you know, what's next, which is something that you've talked about recently in one of your podcasts, right? Like, well, just do this, right? <laughs> like, like you got this to do it. There's a lot to be taken away from it, but consider that if you start in your teens, right? Let's say you're 15 when you start and that's really early. Most people don't start that early. And then you live to be 75. That is six decades, 60 years of fitness that you're going to potentially have in your life. There is time for you to do these things. You don't have to rush it. <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, in, the, in the big scheme of things, fitness should be part of your life forever. If you want to like have a balanced life, people read books and they go to college and spend a lot of money on their intellect to augment it, right? They go to church, they have faith, they mm-hmm. do a lot of spiritual work. Why are we so against spending more time, effort, and money into our physical selves? Because mm-hmm. that's the third wheel right there. Yeah. You need that. Without that, the rest of it is kind of going to fall apart, right? But when you think about it that way, you don't plan on dropping your faith in the next decade or your uh, investments in your intellect. Then, yeah, 10 years from now, you're still going to be doing this. There's room to do a lot of things. Yeah. If I had thought when I was 14 years old, okay, I'm going to do brain mantis and jujitsu and boxing and wrestling and kettlebells and body weight and barbell. It would have been overwhelming, but lucky for me, I get to spread that out throughout my life. Right. Yeah. Twenties, my thirties and now my forties. And I'm just like, just chilling, you know, kicking it. Mm -hmm. Like it's all good. There's time. We're we're having fun with this. (laughs) That's so great. Well, it is. Yeah. If you think about like everything that you do over decades of time, you know, it's that old, it's, you know, it's an old phrase of, 
we under we overestimate what you can do in a year, but vastly underestimate what you can do in ten years. It's yeah, like yeah. if you do it every day. I wanted to ask you that about the intuitive uh, kind of training side of yeah. it as well, because um, I'm a fan of not not limiting people to like you need to do this a certain amount of days. Like I think it's almost imp- even more important for people who are just on the beginning front to do it every day. It's like try and go into every day type approach. Maybe it's going to be different on that. It's like, but I think like if you go into something on an everyday basis, it seems like you actually are you're going to understand your threshold a lot more on that. So like with your practice, like do you do training on an everyday basis? Do you follow more of like a rigid structure right now? Kind of what's your kind of plan that you follow? Well, Mike, why would you ask me a loaded question like that? <laughs> <laughs> Put you right on the spot now. Or, no, yeah. well, okay. So so it varies, right? Like it depends. Like when I was a teenager, I trained almost every day because I would go to martial arts school and practice. And then on our days that we didn't have class, there was a small group of us that got together and practice, but we were teenagers. Our bodies, you know, recovered like this. We were burning through calories like super easy. So in, in addition to we played volleyball, we played basketball, you know, this was like our, our recreational time. We hiked a lot. We went to the river and all that stuff. So there was that part. When I got into the army between the ages of 21 and 27, I was mostly just lifting weights like a bro split, you know, mm-hmm. it was like, gotcha. you know, legs and shoulders, back and bice and chest and tries, baby. You know, yeah. Yep. <laughs> then a half hour of flexing, take a shower. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you always look bigger in the gym mirror. Oh, <laughs> that, that good down lighting right there. Right. <laughs> and then if somebody, if you were around and somebody was like, damn, dude, you look big. You'd be like, oh, you got even bigger, you know? Like, so by then I was doing like, I don't know, three to four times a week mm-hmm. um, throughout that time. And then of course I had like regular PT with the army. And I would try to do that on the same day. So I would hit the weights first and then go do like, you know, our running or calisthenics and things like that. So three or four times a week, that was mostly my 20s. Then when I started dancing between 27 and like 36, and I was also personal training, you can say that I was training every day because I was either teaching, demonstrating, I was rehearsing, performing, you know, just doing something like that. Yep. Then you get into about 36 until about now. So the last 10 years, part of that time I spent in the finance world doing uh, accounting and I, I retained a very modest personal training practice with mm-hmm. a small group that I was training. And I dedicated the majority of that time to perfect my own practice, to mm-hmm. really define, to set myself up for basically 50 and beyond. Mm-hmm. And nowadays I pretty much practice also every day Love it. Um, because at the moment I'm doing strong first. I mean, a strong first plan strong. Okay. Um, so I'm doing squats, bench, presses and pull-ups based on the plan strong protocol. Oof, okay. And I'm doing that every other day. So it's like squats and bench mm-hmm. day in between presses and pull-ups, but in between I'm mostly doing martial arts, Calisthenic stuff, like really, really mellow. Yeah, talking mm-hmm. about fewer than ten reps. It's all recreational it's for me to just have fun and move around a little bit, mm-hmm. almost every day. Um, so if I look at it, if I average all that out, I would say that for the majority of my life, I've worked out pretty much every day. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't mean what you think it means, right? Yes. I'm not. I'm not like blasting myself. A workout to me could be just going in the back and practicing hand balancing for 15 minutes. Yeah. And that, and that can be maybe anywhere from five to 10 hand balances. That's Mm. not strenuous. That's not going to, you know, so just understand that it's different, you know, and and I'm talking to the audience, like don't, don't get this perception that I'm always like lifting heavy and all that stuff. Like I'm completely anti that. Mm -hmm. I I think that too much intensity, like the traps, right? (laughs) Too hard, too often. That's, that's a common trap that we go, you know, and they'll break themselves. And I think longevity needs to be, a big important aspect of how you plan these things. So again, when I say almost every day, please understand that it's not intense. A lot of times it's just really 
it's nurturing my soul more than anything, you know, it's just helping me just kind of soothe my mind and all that, you know? Yeah. I love that. So, and a lot of the work that I've seen you, I mean, your mobility and the grace of movement, I've said, you know, a couple of times already on this podcast, and I'll probably say it a couple more times afterwards, but I mean, I know probably mobility, you've had good flexibility and mobility from all the practices that you've done, but is that something that you still like practice a little bit more of as you've aged? You don't do any, no, no. No. So it's like, um, that's wow. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, no. So another thing that I've heard a lot, another concept or idea or topic that I've heard a lot on this podcast is like, you know, if you, if you go in there and you're like foam rolling for 30 minutes and then doing another 30 minutes of mobility work, and then you're doing whatever, you know, it becomes unsustainable. Yeah. And a big part, I think of what I've tried to convey today is like, this needs to be enjoyable and sustainable Mm -hmm. into, you know, plan for the long run, not for the next, you know, couple of years, because hopefully you get to be 60 or 70 years old and you're still enjoying this great, great vibrant health. And that only happens from the consistent practice of not just one, but several skills that have utility in your life, your strength, bone density, uh, neural health, right? Keeping your mm-hmm. nervous system in, in good order so that you can perform these things, coordination, even the, the the visual and the auditory, like uh, your your not auditory, but um, vestibular health, which yeah. I know in OS is it's like a big t- you know fundamental concept of mm-hmm. what OS is all about. It's about manipulating the vestibular system in order to enhance movement. Okay, so I know all of those things because I have people that I may have to help that need those steps, but. I've already taken all of those steps and there are things that I can do to maintain some of these things that are a little bit more enjoyable for me. Mm. For example, um, do I need to do wrist mobility? Oh, I did it a long time ago in preparation for being a pretty consistent hand balancer, but now I can practice my hand balance and that contributes to the mobility of my, it, Mm. it maintains my tissues in good order and health so that I can perform the activity. If I practice my kicks and, you know, Four stands, basic combinations of martial arts. I practice my forms, my hips, my knees, my ankles. They all maintain a basic level of performance that I need to perform that activity. Mm. If I were to step away for a long time and then try to come back to it, right? Like, for example, if I went to dance again now, I think I would do some really basic level stuff for a few months solid. Right. Try to feel like, okay, am, am I still able to do this without risk of injury? But that's because I don't do the, the, the dance as much anymore. Right. Mm-hmm. But it, I don't think it's necessary once you establish certain like levels of fitness to maintain certain things like the deep squats that I do, they feel better when I'm loaded. I grab a couple of 24 kilo kettlebells mm-hmm. and I drop into a squat and I feel great where there are times when I just drop down with, you know, with body weight. And I'm like, you know, you feel like, Oh yeah. <laughs> not as well, not as good. Right. So <laughs> So, you know, the nervous system is a really interesting thing. It's all about information coming in. There's some kind of processing up there. There's an interpretation of that information. And then there's an output. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, grabbing heavy kettlebells and dropping into a squat is a good input because the output is, I feel good. There's a sense of well-being about doing that. And when I'm consistent with my body weight, I can do, you know, pistols and one arm push Mm -hmm. and all that. And it just feels good. You just get up and you're like, oh, you know, but it takes away, God, and I hate to say this, but, you know, some of that stuff can be a little bit mundane and boring. You know, I mean, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. If you need it, I I encourage you to do it. I would never tell you not to do it. But for my own personal practice, because of the consistency of it over decades, I'm able to do certain things and get, get away without not having to do a lot of that stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I like that you brought it up of just like the neurological output and the, and the coordination of it. I think that's something that we can look at as well. If you, if you keep those things strong, then everything else is probably going to come into play. It keeps coming back into, I think it's the enjoyable aspect of it. Like it's okay to just keep doing things that are enjoyable. You know, I had a client call the other day who, you know, she was in one of those times she got sick, then was kind of off track. Like everybody's had that time. You're just off track and you feel like you're way more off path than what you think. Right. And it's like, what do I do? Do I double up? Do I do extra work right now? Or what should I'm like, well, what do you enjoy doing? Like we've done a bunch of training. We've done a bunch of workouts. Like, what do you enjoy? It's like, well, I remember we did this workout, like after a minute of thought. And I was like, why don't you do that for a couple of days in a row? 
go back to the things that you enjoy doing. You know, it's like, that's why I've, you know, I was cracking up. I've got people asking me about half snatching. I'm like, I just enjoy half snatching. I was like, there's no actual specific goal to it right now. It's just when I want to go and just move for the day, I'm just going into that because it feels good. My mobility feels good. Strength feels good. And I think that's kind of the missing piece as, uh, piece as coaches that we can get into. It's like, yeah, results are good. Like you want to get into programming, but this could just be a really fun thing to do. Son, it should be, right? Like, again, if you're, if you're going to do it for so long, it should be enjoyable. Yeah. Anything that we do in life that it's going to be for the rest of our life, including choosing a mate, right? <laughs> it should be an enjoyable experience. <laughs> So, you know, when you, when you commit to one of these modalities, it's kind of like marrying it, you know, you're like, okay, now, now, I, yeah. but just understand with yeah. the modalities, yeah. it's not like you're made in terms of like, you're with them forever. You can pick things up and put them back down and pick them back yeah. up. And again, this is one of the important aspects of strong furs and hard style kettlebells that lends itself to, to this type of mentality of lifelong type of practice, because it's the principles. Mm -hmm. The tool doesn't matter, right? At the moment, I'm mostly lifting barbells, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, how do you keep your kettlebell skills? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they're not going to go away yeah. in the four <laughs> months that I'm going to be doing this, you know? <laughs> like, or right. the body weight, you know? I'll spend the summer doing nothing but body weight. And I, I did that as an experiment because I'm trying to write a small pamphlet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm calling it a pamphlet because uh, when I was in the army, there was these little pamphlets that were called um, field pamphlet or something like that or it was just like a little tiny like guidance on a specific subject, you know, like, I don't know how to build a fire or whatever, or how to maintain your weapon. Yeah. But I want to build a little pamphlet that revolves around the one arm, one leg push up and all the things that I've discovered that mm. have been helpful for me to maintain it, even when I'm not practicing it regularly. So like right now I can drop and do several one arm, one leg push ups, no big deal, but there's two drills that I do regularly to maintain that and they're like a like a like a measuring stick for me if i struggle doing that drill i know that uh oh this is not good i get i need to test my one arm one leg push up but what i'm working on is the skill of tension the ability to maintain dynamic posture alignment throughout a very complex movement set right and so if i can if i can do that then I know I'm good because I'm just working on the principles and the ideas that allow me to do a specific movement without having to practice it itself. Um, and though, if, if I can do that, then I'm good. At the moment, I'm doing the barbell, but the way that I pick up, you know, that I set up for my yep. bench or my squats, I can tell if my body is coordinating all that strength the way that yeah. it should. And it will translate, it will translate into a pistol. It will translate into arm like push up, into, you know, a really slow pull up or, you know, mm -hmm. like, this coming this coming summer, I'd like to start working on one arm chins. Okay. And I'm hoping that it will translate into that as well, you know, and, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So that's that's the beauty of Strong First and its philosophy is that it gives you permission to work on your skill above the different modalities, because that's really the governing thing at the top. If you have right. the skill of strength, you'll be able to apply it to anything. Yeah. Well, and I think too, like with that ceiling that you have of like kind of pushing that potential, it's like the standards that you kind of hold yourself to is kind of like the floor of that. I remember I talked with Karen uh, Smith for a while about this, of just keeping the standards, you know, of down of stuff. And I think it's, you know, kind of going back to that topic of structure versus intuition, you know, and it, that's been a fun topic I've talked about on this podcast. I've had a lot of people I've talked with offline about it as well. Um, because I'm kind of in a personal journey of doing it there. But with if you can build to those standards, like keep following that structure down, build those standards, then all of a sudden, all these other things kind of come out and you can explore these different things. You can be more creative with it. So, and I think that's that's a really cool thing that you're doing because it's like, if you can see if one thing does transfer over into another one, like those are, that's just like the fun things that you can do now. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've, I've had the honor of assisting Coach uh, Smith many times at certifications for the SFB, and she talks a lot about those baselines. And it's a really important aspect of the way that she teaches programming to. Mm -hmm. It's just knowing, like, look, I know this is my baseline. And sometimes they can be very different things. Like, you know, she can do, like, one-handed deadlifts with the beast. She knows that it checks off the box for this many movements that have nothing to do with kettlebells. Yes. 
And it's really good to get that insight because you may never discover that on your own, you know, but that's the, the value of having these very high level coaches in our field and uh, in our organization that can basically take 20 years of experience and give it to you to a certain degree over the course of three days. You know, if you go home and apply it and you're listening and tuned in, you can do all of those things, but absolutely yeah. like baselines are super important uh, in order to do what you were saying, right? Like to maintain these different skills and all that stuff. And yeah. here's another thing that I will say. I think that in the beginning, it's important to separate these things and give it its important time. You know, just, just devote the time to learn that. But over the course of a long time performing these different drills, you can get into a system where you're mixing a few of them. And that can be really, really fun. Yeah. You know, so Oof. the whole thing, yeah. The whole thing about the four chambers in in the iron iron core, yeah. iron core and the four chambers is body weight, kettlebell, barbell. And what's the fourth one? It's the combination of the three. Mm. And that's what, but you got to earn that, you know? Yeah. Like you got to earn that so that you can enjoy it and not hurt yourself when you're doing it. Kind of like with the workshop, right? You want to go to the workshop and enjoy it. You don't want to rip your hands on freaking Friday. Yeah, <laughs> well, know? it's... That's such an interesting thing, you know, because, uh, you know, Karen's like the way to do that, like, oh, I can do a one arm deadlift. And that's going to tell me a lot about what I'm capable of at that moment. That's a really romantic thing to like build up and get to. But like, I mean, she's done it for so long. She's built that up for a while. And I think it kind of ties all back into like the work that you did, like ETK for three years, like just practice these things over and over again and just build up kind of have faith of just doing it just over and over again. It's like, it's kind of so funny that like I've talked to Tim Allman quite a bit about his work with heart styles with the heart style methods and snatching and like you snatch for a year and it's like the same thing over and over. And Tim's a guy who could snatch the 48 K like, you know, 10 times, like nothing. It makes it look like a 24. He's practicing with the 20 K with the 24 K getting so deep into the movement. It's like, it's a, it's a different type of practice, but I tell you, like, I think that's, there's such a key to joy and fulfillment of doing this, of doing those things. And it's not something if you're right at the beginning step, I think it's so great. Like absolutely follow these disciplines. But I think there's a lot of people that are somewhere in that middle zone. It's like, they've done a lot of the good things. They've got a lot of the results, but something's still missing for it. Yeah. It's like, yeah, just follow that path of mastery a little bit more. Just follow this path. And these things will come up over time. It might take you a while to get to that zone, but it's coming eventually, right? Yeah, it really is. Like we, we, you and I mentioned that before we started recording and I was like, like, like if you find yourself in that high intermediate or like low level advanced student or practitioner, and you're really curious about this intuitive stuff, then try it with one rule. And the rule is that there's gotta be a little bit of, substance and structure to it right yes. if you give yourself if you say look i'm gonna i'm gonna train intuitively for the next couple of weeks and see how it goes and it's like i'm gonna do these many moves i'm gonna try to maintain my volume at this level or something like that give yourself some parameters that are aimed at keeping you safe so that you do not get mm -hmm. hurt and it allows for that playful experimentation right if yes. you if you if your playful experimentation takes you too far down the line and it takes you too long to recover from sessions and things like that, then you know that maybe you need to structure it even more and right. not be so intuitive and then try to find that balance because just like anything else, being intuitive and training is a, and a skill like any other, any other, and you're going to have to develop that skill through trial and error. You can learn from people, you know, like Brad and Tim and uh, who else is known for like intuitive training? Well, Todd Hargrove, it's like, you know, he's all about the, the playful movement of- uh, Yeah, with the Feldenkrais method. Yeah, I mean, he's done it. Ad, you know, Adam Glass has done, and him and Frankie have done such good work with biofeedback. Iron Tamer, you know, Dave Whitley's done a lot yeah. of this work too. Okay. So you see, there's a lot of substance out there to be extracted from existing material that you can apply to this. You don't have to do it on your own. But just mm. be reasonable, be prudent, right? Like, don't, don't get crazy. Like, don't try to do- 300 snatch workouts on your first month of training. That's just yeah. silly. That's what my intuition told me though, Oz. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's well, funny. I'm you know, sorry that I stand I, I know. correctly. <laughs> you know, it, it comes back. There's there's a great great um question that uh, Brian Grosso gave me a while ago was, you should always you know have that question of, is it something, do I need to know more 
or do I need to use what I know better? Yes. And it's like, and I always came back to that. I think it has such a, a it has such a good um, kind of marriage into the intuitive training of it, you know, because it's something I've questioned a lot about before. It's like, cause intuition, you can, that can go a lot of different routes. You're trying to explore these things where it's like, sometimes it's like, you know, if you find a good path, a good structure to work with, you don't need to just go and just veer off the road because you're being intuitive on it. You can just follow that again. You can keep doing that over and over again. You know, I built this analogy of the highway of strength with my clients of like the right lane, middle lane, left lane, and kind of determining that lane. And I kind of, in my own, just learning and just experimentation over this, I was like, you know, if you keep staying in the right lane and it's just a nice, easy day, that's really good too. You know, if like, if you're really structured on another, that's really good too. Like there's no wrong answers to this. And I think that's where I get so much out of these conversations about it because it's not, we're not just searching for the right answer. We're just searching for another possible answer and getting to know what we know a little bit better in it, not trying to find more information down the line. You know, I, you know, I've heard you use this analogy in the past in some of your shows, and I think it's beautiful because it, it's so, it parallels life. Like life is like that too, right? And, yeah. and so, so much of training can be like life. Um, I just think that the, um, the, the, the fundamental piece is to be prudent and to be like patient with yourself because mm -hmm. all it takes is like one bad day at the gym to like, for, for you to have horrible days for months or years on out, right? So just avoid that at all costs. Like I, you know, I I've often think, should I train to avoid injuries? And the answer is no, you should not train that way because that's coming from a place of fear and you shouldn't live that way. And more importantly, from an evolutionary standpoint, if you are in fear, your movement is going to be inhibited by, that's just what the nervous system does. Because if it thinks you're in danger or you might be in danger, it won't allow you to do mm. that, that activity 100%. So that's not a good place to be, but just be reasonable with what you can do, right? Like you said, you can stay in the slow lane for a while. Yeah. Inevitably, inevitably, at some point, you're going to pick up speed, you know? Yes. And, and if you let that happen organically, man, that's the, that's, that's the best. That's the flow that we were talking about. Yeah. If all of a sudden you find yourself going really fast and passing everyone and you didn't even try, you should... Thank the head of the Lords for that, because that's an amazing <laughs> feeling, right? That's like it hitting is. the home run. That's like hitting the solo, right? That's the that goal. is. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, that's a mic drop moment. I think we'll close. <laughs> I think we'll wrap it up on that one, Oz. Um, Oz, awesome. dude, thank you so much for coming. Thank on. you. I, yeah, I got to have you back on. We are just getting started on this. So we'll just we're just going to keep this conversation rolling another time. I um, really appreciate it. I love the work that you're doing keep doing you, man. If people want to follow you, want to check out more of the work you got, I know you're teaching some certifications in your area and some workshops and stuff. Where's the best place that they can go to? So ironcoreway.com is our website. Uh, under the events tab, you will find all of our events. We have uh, workshops, four-hour workshops, official Strong First in San Diego. Uh, the 29th of this month is going to be Body Wade, uh, one of my favorites. November 6th, uh, down an extreme fitness in Chula Vista with Alex Verdugo. We're going to be doing uh, Rite of Passage, another one of my favorites. And then on the 12th of November, I'm going to be traveling to Wyoming to do um, Kettlebell 101 and Barbell 101 with our good friend and colleague, uh, Maggie Jones. Uh, she's also on SFG. Actually, SFG too. Sorry. Oh, awesome. So, uh, very busy with the workshops and super excited because this is, this is what I love to do, man. I've been dreaming of this for a long time. And thank you for having me on the show because... Another thing that I can check off my list. <laughs> 100%, man. No, I love the work that you're doing for our community. It's awesome. I appreciate it. And um, till next time, brother, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found some great value here. And if you like this episode, please drop a comment and leave us a five-star rating and review. It does more to build the show than you can imagine. And do not forget to check out and join the Strength Connection Facebook group. In this group, I share the biggest takeaways and lessons from these amazing conversations, as well as training and strength tips for pursuing mastery and fulfillment in life. It's, this group is filled with individuals looking to take full control over their strength, and it's the perfect space to explore new ideas and to share your journey. And you'll also get exclusive access to the Strength Connection Mastery Seminars. It's a deep dive into the physical, mental, and spiritual training that you can begin using immediately. So do not wait. Go now. Seriously, go. I right, much love to you. Thank you so much, and I'll catch you on the next one.